up? It's your boy T-Bear, her reaction. Today's film is now Films Friday, and we're going to get into the Films Friday Kill Count reaction. This week is Horror Week as well, too. No, this is Classic Horror Week. As you know, a lot of folks want me to do some Classic Horror films as well, too. And we're, I've been going in order of their releases. And this next one is the last of the single, well, some of the last of the old school black and white ones well too because after this the next one we'll do is the speed run of all the classes including the ones I've done as well too and then after that will be some three bonuses of classic films as well too one is kind of black and white but it's uh it was a part of the, the old classic classic but anyway we're going to check out narrow not not too long ago I did the re reboot of the remake of the classic horror film The Wolfman with uh, Benicio Vettoro, I guess his name is. Now we're going to do the original OG, The Wolfman, that came out in 1941. But before that, the time I'd like to do this as well too, to to move things move it along, is, is treat this like a movie and play a trailer as well too. And it's a perfect trailer. Not The title-wise, slow so a perfect trailer as we deal with WrestleMania. And this is called Bloodline Killer. <laughs> I hope that didn't jinx me, jinx it to jinx, jinx my chance of Cody winning to, on, on Sunday night as well, too. So, anyway, this is a new movie called The Boy Like Killer. It stars uh, Shawnee Smith, you best known from um, the first known from uh, Saw movie. So, anyway, without further ado, let's see what this movie's all about. Let's get it. Miss Mora, I'm Detective Cypher. Look, I know you've been through a lot tonight. Oh, it's Arise! Help me find the person that killed your husband. Oh, Lord. Yeah. Wow. Ooh. The killer is still at large. <laughs> I missed Dad. We're not meant to suffer alone. Wow. So keep going. Still trying to get to the bottom of what happened. You and your sons deserve a better life. <laughs> Skeleton Terry is Manning. dead. Why didn't name that sound familiar? Because I, I knew that, that name sounded too familiar. I'm trying to figure where he's from. Why didn't name sound familiar? Oh, okay. Ah, what movie is Oh, the Hustle of Flow girl. Okay. The blonde haired chick with the Hustle and Flow. I know she was on, uh, oh, yeah, she was on Orange and New Black. But some of these guys, some of the kids look familiar. Hold on a second, Bloodline Killer. Some of the, the ones that play her son look familiar. That's why. Done. Yeah, Drew Morley, where he's from. Oh, he he been on a lot of stuff. Yeah, he kind of he kind of was like a he almost looked like um what's his name's uh he was like uh Kurt Russell's son a little bit. You never found his body. Oh, there is a killer on the loose, folks. You think it's him, don't you? Let's move. Do you know what it feels like to be stalked? To be the prey? No, I don't. I hope you never do. Open the door! You're down on the ground! Please don't do this. Yes, you go. This looks crazy, man. This is like a definitely should not move your swords, though. So anyway, now we'll get to our feature presentation with the kill count for the Wolfman. Let's get it. Oh, 
Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at The Wolfman. We're killing me with your hair, James. Released in 1941. In the early 30s, Universal released Dracula, Frankenstein, and The Invisible Man. But their sequels, and other Universal horror pictures, faced a three-year gap following Dracula's daughter. When they returned in 1939 with Son of Frankenstein, it kicked off a phase two of sorts, with The Wolfman the first original character of the era. And I mean original. Unlike his three predecessors I've looked at before, The Wolfman wasn't based on any pre-existing literature. Instead, it came from an Ooh, original screenplay okay. by Kurt Seodmach. Alongside 1935's Werewolf of London, The Wolfman is among the earliest depictions of werewolves in Hollywood. Though werewolves can be found in folklore across many cultures, The Wolfman established the mythology that would be seen in countless other werewolf mm -hmm. movies. And yes, The Wolfman is the first werewolf movie on the kill count. That wasn't intentional or anything, I just never got around to one before now. Like Frankenstein before him, the Wolfman is a tragic monster. By day, he's Larry Talbot, a businessman recently returned to his family home. But when the sun sets, he becomes a bloodthirsty lycanthrope, unable to control his own actions. I think the Wolfman is one of the more popular of the group, simply because he's the one that people can relate to the most easily. Nobody can relate to being a Transylvanian count. That relatability is helped by the fact that the Wolfman is the only classic universal monster to be played by the same actor in every appearance. The six foot two line John Chaney Jr. Chaney was born Creighton Tall Chaney, but was frequently billed under the name of his famous father. Lon Chaney Sr. was the legendary Man of a Thousand Faces, wow. probably most widely known as the OG Phantom Man of the Opera. Opera. After a sort of trial run in Man Made Monster, Chaney Jr. was picked by Universal to be their monster star for this new era. In contrast to the exotic European leads before him, the American Lon Chaney Jr. appealed to the U.S.'s patriotic sensibilities in the wartime 1940s. Chaney Jr. would take Take the Wolfman to meet Frankenstein, visit the houses of Dracula mm. and Frankenstein, and meet Abbott and Costello with Lord. Frankenstein. Not a Frankenstein in there. Unfortunately, the character would never get a standalone sequel, only ever teaming up with other monsters. Don't let that diminish this movie's impact, though. It set the ground Indeed. rules for werewolves that we still use today, and is largely responsible for the creature's status as an S-tier Halloween monster. Let's sink our teeth into this 80-year-old classic and get to the kills. The movie begins with some disembodied hands leafing through an encyclopedia. Mm. Ah yes, lycanthropy, werewolf disease, an affliction mm. that has long plagued Talbot Castle, apparently. Larry Talbot's headed to that castle, and he sure is proud of these special effects. He spent the last 18 years in the United States, but is returning to his ancestral home in Wales because his brother just died in a hunting accident. Oh. Sorry bro, but you should have been hunting with Lon Chaney, not Dick. Larry's greeted by his father, Sir Really, James? You got Joe show. John Talbot. Welcome home, Larry. I'm mighty glad to be here, Father. Oh, damn. Been away so long he lost his accent. Also, we got a real Ray Dominic Mysterio thing going on here. <laughs> Larry briefly runs into a childhood friend, Paul Montfort, who's now the chief constable of police. Paul leaves so the father and son can start healing. Talbot and Shortbutt have been estranged ever since Larry's brother was made heir to the estate. Wait, that's his brother? Were they identical twins? Well, they're not identical anymore since Larry's brother is dead. Dead, so he begins to make amends with his father. It's interrupted by a delivery. Ah yes, the box of glass I ordered. Did someone label that with their non-dominant hand? Sir John kicks off the father-son bonding like a divorced dad, letting Larry play with his telescope. Larry quickly gets his rear window on, using this attic observatory to somehow get street-level views of the village. He spies on a pretty lady at the antique shop across the street. Since he's not hampered by a broken leg, he goes over and flirts with her in person. And by flirt, I mean be a total fucking creed. What I'm really looking for is uh, something half moon shaped with spangles on it, golden. Oh, I'm sorry. We haven't any like that just now. Oh, yes, you have. Don't you remember? on your dressing table up in your room. Yo, that's kind of terrifying, dude. The woman, Gwen Conliffe, retorts by comparing him to a canine. How about the little dog? That would suit you. He eventually picks out something to buy, a cane topped with a silver wolf's head and a star. Gwen says its design was inspired by old local werewolf lore. Even a man who is pure in heart and says his prayers by night may become a wolf when the wolf bang blooms and the autumn moon is bright. 
deep in the heart of Texas. This poem, really? written by screenwriter Kurt Seodmach, would appear in many of the Wolfman's follow-up films, although its last line would be changed from the autumn moon is bright to the moon is full and bright, since, you know, not all of them took place during autumn. Larry purchases the canine cane, but his attempt to ask Gwen on a date is turned down. No. A couple of times. See you at eight. No. Uh, how about tonight? No. This guy did not grow up listening to TMBG. Fine, I'll be here at eight. His persistence finds him waiting for her when she gets off work that night, but having assumed he'd be a hound, Gwen brings along a friend to be her guard dog. Larry, Gwen, and Jenny skip into the foggy woods to check out a camp of Romani travelers. The movie uses a different word, but I won't be because it's usually considered a pejorative. They meet a fortune teller named Bela, played by a mustachioed Bela Lugosi, last seen on the kill count, of course, as Count Dracula. Lugosi wanted to be the wolf man, but the studio went with Cheney instead. Despite a rumored rivalry, the two would work together five more times, wow. sharing the title roles in the first monster crossover, Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman. Jenny right goes in for long. a one-on-one -on -one reading with Bela, freeing up Larry and Gwen to slip off into the woods alone. Gwen is played by Evelyn Ankers, a horror actress known as the Queen of the Bees. Does that make her Ms. Candyman? Ankers Lord. and Cheney reportedly didn't get along, with him sometimes sneaking up on and scaring her in full makeup. But they'd go on to co-star in five more films together, including Son of Dracula, where Cheney played the Count. Those Universal Monster actors swapped roles so much, they probably had key parties for them. Larry nice. starts things off with a very assertive lean, but Gwen quickly stops the would-be Casanova. It's only fair to tell you I'm engaged. I'm going to be married very soon. In his tent, Bela is also receiving bad news about the future. During a palm reading, he sees a pentagram on Jenny's hand. According to local legend, that means she's future werewolf chow. What's this pentagram business? Every werewolf is marked with that and sees it in the palm of his next victim's hand. This star marking had a tragic real-world inspiration. Screenwriter Seodmach was a German Jew who had fled Hitler's regime in the 30s. Oh, wow. He wrote this thinking of the Jewish badge that Nazis forced his people to wear. It looks like Bela's batting for Team Jacob. Just check out that lick and stick star tad on oh, his head. Shit. Better run like Forrest, Jen A, and scream too loud for the mic while you're at it. <laughs> Before she can get out of there, Bela transforms into a werewolf off screen. Uh -oh. Uh, yeah, maybe don't invite people over during werewolf hour, werewolf. Gwen and Larry hear Jenny screaming, prompting Larry to bound into the forest to find her. He comes across her being mauled by a large wolf, played by a German shepherd named Moose. Moose had been a stray on the Universal lot until Cheney adopted him as a pet. Mm. Ah, Moose, nice. such a good boy. In the ensuing scuffle, Larry's torso gets nommed on for a bit before he manages to beat the dog down with his cane. The injured Larry staggers away before collapsing against a tree. He's found by Gwen and Bela's mother, Maliva, who's been kind of creeping around the periphery so far. The two get Larry back to Talbot Castle, where Sir John and Paul are having a drink together. I guess George and Ringo just left. Maliva pieces Lord. out immediately. I see you later, right before one of Paul's officers shows up with bad news. Jenny, Jenny Williams, what about her? She's been murdered. I love how much actor Forrester Harvey hams it up. Mr. Twiddle. Oh wait, I'm sorry. And his name is Mr. Twiddle? Hell yeah. That's Twiddle amazing. takes notes while Paul Oof. investigates Jenny's body, whose jugular has been severed by an animal. Her body. Animal bite. <laughs> Twiddle don't like that one biddle. What's the matter with you, Twiddle? Oh, I'm a little squeamish, sir. It's either mm. this or in-keeping Twiddle. At least I here, an invisible man won't throw you down the stairs. Now, while animals don't go on the count, they do if they're actually human. And based on the barefoot body of Bela, that big bad wolf was really a guy. Look, his feet are bare. So they are. Aw, oh, shit, and he died with his dog's hound. Unlike Jenny, Bela's been beaten to death, likely by a human, and likely with this cane. The distinct cane leads the police to Larry's bed the next morning, and they question him when he wakes up. He insists he killed a wolf, and says he has the bite marks to prove it. But one looky-loo down that jammy shirt, and ain't no wound to be found. It's mysteriously healed overnight. Family friend Dr. Lloyd is very understanding of Larry's situation. Don't try to make me believe that I killed a man when I know that I killed a wolf. Yes, yes. Yes, we're all a little bit confused. The Walt Disney wannabe is obviously ah, suspicious, like so Sir John movie. takes control of the situation. Now, please, gentlemen, there's a very simple explanation. A dog or a wolf attacked Jenny Williams, that's proven. When she cried for help, Larry and Bela went to her rescue. It was dark. 
Excitement and confusion, the gypsy was killed. Way to passive voice your son's murder, dude. You might be more familiar with Sir John's voice than his face, since he's played by Claude Rains, the original Invisible Man. Oh. You're crazy to know who I am, aren't you? Due to Sir John's influence, and because these guys ain't gonna give a shit about a Romani fortune teller's death, Dr. Lloyd agrees to keep Larry out of the asylum, and Constable Paul agrees to drop Larry as a suspect. After all, rich boys will be boys. Must be nice to have a dad who owns a frickin' castle. All these crooked deals don't sit well with Jenny's mother, who storms into Gwen's shop with her gal pals and tells Gwen's dad his daughter's a hussy. She didn't do anything wrong. Anything wrong? It's because of her that my little Jenny was killed. Oh, that's enough. Larry arrives and puts a stop to their accusations in a shot that really conveys Lon Chaney Jr.'s imposing size. Yeah. This man is a wall! No wonder Universal also cast him as both Frankenstein and oh. the mummy. Larry checks on Gwen, but things get tense when her fiance Frank Andrews swings by and walks in on the two of them standing there super sus. Larry, this is Frank Andrews. Even the dog can smell the infidelity. Frank is the gamekeeper for the Talbot estate. We saw him earlier with Paul and Mr. Twiddle at Jenny's murder scene. He ain't looking to shake hands with the man trying to cuck him, so Larry excuses himself. After he leaves, Frank has some prophetic words about his boss's son. Well, there's something very tragic about that man. I'm sure that nothing but harm will come to you through him. And he's definitely not jealous at all. The couple runs into Larry that night at a carnival, where Frank challenges Larry to a game. Unfortunately for Lair Lair, that game is... SHOOT THAT wolf. I love how utterly unconcerned Frank is, while Larry clearly has some sort of traumatic flashback. Go ahead and shoot before he bites you. Bad luck. See, nothing to it. Jesus, Frank, kick a dog while he's down. Larry runs off with his tail between his legs, and on his way out, he encounters Maliba, who sits him down to explain what happened to him. Bela became a wolf, and you killed him. A werewolf can be killed only with a silver bullet, or a silver knife, or a stick with a silver handle. Or a silver dollar, or a <laughs> silver fox, or a silver surfer. Maybe even the Silver Sun pickups. Lord. Similar to what Romero did with zombies, screenwriter Sealedmach's depiction of werewolves is still the blueprint we use today. There are a ton of werewolf rules I had assumed came from older folklore, but were actually invented for this movie, including their moonlight transformations, their aversion to the wolfsbane flower, and their weakness to silver. This movie also established how new werewolves are created. Oh, yeah, but is bitten by a werewolf and lives becomes a werewolf himself. Call that shit bitosis. The chain chop rule means Larry's <laughs> in danger of going rabid, so Maliva gives him a charm she claims will keep his inner wolf restrained. The pentagram, the sign of the wolf, it can break the evil spell. Huh, kinda sounds like your uh, son could abuse something like that. She commands Larry to wear the charm at all times. It'll protect him, so after he leaves, he immediately gives it to Gwen. I won't need this. I want you to have it. Bang up job there, Lair. The trauma-bound lovebirds steal an illicit kiss, but they're quickly swept up as the camp descends into chaos. There's a werewolf in camp! Well, yeah, but I ain't hurt nobody. Gwen rushes out, leaving Larry behind to contemplate this insane montage of dissolves and kaleidoscope shots. Whoa! He flees back to Talbot Castle, where he discovers he's begun growing a new set of leg warmers. Drat! Through a series of dissolves done by early effects artist John P. Fulton, Larry's legs transform into a set of hairy paws, which were made out of hard rubber and covered in yak hair. He takes his new kicks out for a stroll, and we get our first proper peek at the titular wolfman. Kinda makes you wonder why Larry didn't turn into a full-on dog like Bela did, right. but whatever gives us this classic monster look. Cheney's makeup was created by Jack Pierce, the pioneering artist behind Dracula, Frankenstein's monster, and the mummy. Pierce had actually designed this makeup for 1935's Werewolf of London, but actor Henry Hall rejected it, wanting to be recognizable even in werewolf form. Good call on Hall's part, honestly. Unlike Chaney, he didn't have to deal with a face full of burnt yak hair. Yak's hair was applied in layers and trimmed and then scorched with a curling iron and curled and blended. Now that's what I call a hot dog. Jack Pierce was known for building up his monster makeup piece by piece. The only rubber appliance on any of his creations is the wolf nose used here, made by Ellis Berman Sr., an effects artist who also made the wolf's head cane topper. Harry Larry comes across a grave digger named Richardson and decides to have a midnight snack, puppy chowing down into the poor guy's neck. He celebrates his first kill with some howling at the moon, waking up the nearby villagers. Did you hear that, Mr. Twiddle? Of course I did, otherwise I'd be snuggling all in bed. 
Oh, Wolfman, you're fucking up Twiddle's snuggle time! <laughs> the Welsh village outside of Talbot Castle was played by the Court of Miracles, an area on the Universal Studios backlot that was also used in Dracula and Frankenstein. It was named after a Lon Chaney Sr. film, 1919's The Miracle Man. The villagers find Richardson's body, and Paul notices wolf tracks leading away from the scene. Unbeknownst to him, they belong to Larry, who's woken up in bed with a massive fang over. His fears of lycanthropy are confirmed when he sees a star on his chest, although that thing looks less like the mark of a werewolf and more like something you'd punch out of a cookie at gunpoint. <laughs> so John and company meet up to discuss the recent attacks. I've got to admit, for me, the Wolfman is on a tier below the three earlier monster movies I've covered. That might have something to do with this trio of lackluster side characters. None of these dudes are interesting to me. They ask Larry to describe the animal that's been on a killing spree. It isn't a wolf. What do you mean? It's a werewolf. While Paul is quick to dismiss the idea, Dr. Lloyd tries to meet him halfway, suggesting that werewolves can exist in a psychosomatic form. A person could basically drive themselves into believing that they're a wolf man. Science has found many examples of the mind's power over the body. Like Frank before him, Paul is completely oblivious to Larry's fragile mental state. Doctor, can these sick people be cured? Not they. An asylum's the only safe place for them. <laughs> oh yeah, Paul? Well, I bet Rosemary's got some things to say about your oh, medical know-how. Whether it's a werewolf or not, Frank intends on catching the beast, so he takes Paul to organize a hunting party. Dr. Lloyd pulls Sir John aside and insists they have Larry committed, but the senior Talbot is confident his son can pull through with a stiff upper lip. That night, Larry goes on the prowl again. Remember, the full moon amendment to the werewolf poem wasn't added until later appearances, so in this movie, werewolves transform every night during autumn. That'll put a wrench in your spooky season. He's quickly caught in one of the hunting party's bear traps, and his howls of pain attract Paul and Frank's pack of werewolf hunters. They also attract Maliva, who I think says some kind of spell that transforms Larry back into a human? Am I getting that right? Because again, lady, your son really could have used something like that. <laughs> Maliva is played by Russian actress Maria Uspenskaya, who'd reprise the role in Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman oh, wow. the following year. Larry awakens in a panic, and Maliva tells him he's being hunted. He gets away, but it's a close call. What are you doing here, sir? Why, the same thing that you are, of course, hunting. And prancer-sizing! He limps straight to the antique shop, where he rouses his Juliet by tossing stones at her window. He tells Gwen he'll be going away for a while. Oh, I gotta go. I can't stay here any longer. Oh, let me go with you. I'll fetch you a few things and be back in a minute. Lady, you met this guy like a week ago. Larry's afraid he'll hurt Gwen, and a pentagram on her hand gives his fears foundation. Knowing she's marked as his next victim, he rushes out and leaves her behind. The following night, Larry tries to tell his father he's a werewolf, but Sir John insists it's all in his head. To cure him of his beliefs, Sir John binds Larry to a cherry and locks all the exits. Great plan if Larry's a werewolf. Awful plan if the house catches fire. The elder Talbot leaves to comb the forest with Paul and his men, but he humors Larry by taking his silver cane for protection. Sir John meets his companions in the woods, but perhaps second-guessing his parenting skills, decides to head back to Talbot Castle. He runs into Maliva and accuses her of taking advantage of his son, but she can read him like an encyclopedia page about lycanthropy. Were you heading back to the castle? Did you have a moment's doubt? Where you heading to make sure he's all right? They're interrupted by gunshots echoing in the forest. The hunting party's found their mark, though it hasn't done them much good. I could have sworn I hit him dead on. And I too. Have you forgotten it takes a silver bullet for a werewolf? Sir John leaves to look for his son, and Maliva runs into Gwen, who's come to find Larry as well. Come on, Gwen. Everyone's warning you to stay away from that guy. Oh, no, no. I've got to find him. Come with me or he will find you. In Soviet Russia, Wolfman finds you. And find her he does stalking Gwen as she continues her search. He pounces, and her screams attract the nearby men. Larry chokes Gwen unconscious in a stunt that nearly proved mm. fatal for anchors. Not because of the actual strangling, but because she almost suffocated, breathing in the artificial Ooh. fog after being dropped to the floor. The foggy forest, almost a character itself, was shot by cinematographer Joseph Valentine, a five-time Oscar nominee who also shot Hitchcock's Rope. The werewolf moves on to a newly arrived Sir John, who fares a bit better than Gwen thanks to the silver Kane. Sir John manages to get the upper paw and beats the wolfman down just as Maliva arrives. She kneels to comfort Larry, who slowly morphs back into his human form as he dies. This famous shot was the most
most involved effect in the film, with Pierce building up Cheney's werewolf makeup bit by bit between takes. While Pierce had a reputation for being short-tempered, his relationship with Cheney Jr. was particularly strained, probably aggravated by the unpleasant six-hour makeup process for the Wolfman. Cheney claimed Pierce would burn him intentionally while singeing the yak hair on his face. Ouch. Maliva rides off into the fog as the rest of the men arrive, leaving Sir John to mourn his dead son. Frank quickly attends to his fallen fiance, and the movie abruptly ends with Gwen doing him dirty one last time. Larry. My name is Frank, Gwen. Frank! How many casualties did we count thanks to our canine killer? Let's find out and get to the numbers. <laughs> Four people died in The Wolfman, with the victims consisting of one woman, one man, and two wolfmen. If you count the wolfmen as male, which I will, this count in gender breakdown was seen six times before on this show. Compared to his universal pals, the wolfman had the lowest body count. See, he really is a good boy. With a runtime of 70 minutes, we had a kill on average every 17 and a half minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Larry Talbot. I feel like I have to, given how much Cheney suffered to get it done. It's a classic shot in movie makeup history. Dolma Shetty for Lamest Kill will go to Jen A, since her body was found after getting killed off screen. And that's it. The Wolfman came out in 1941 and was rebooted in 2010 as a compound word. I'll look at that next week, because I know you kids like the newer movies. But until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. On the next Kill Count. We've counted the Invisible Man reboot. <laughs> we haven't gone near Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Ah! It's alive. <laughs> and I've never even seen Dracula 2000. All I want to do is suck. But now it's time to howl at a CGI moon with The Wolfman, the 2010 Universal Monster remake. Ridiculous, it will go to such lengths. The Wolfman loses its spacing and ups its pacing with frenetic werewolf action. Benicio Del Toro stars as Larry oh, Talbot, The Wolfman. A monster. And that's not all. You're not the only one in the family who can out. Sir Anthony Hopkins is also here to collect a paycheck. I suppose I did. Throw in an Agent Smith and a Mary Poppins, and you've got a cast exerting various levels of effort. Nevertheless, I thank you. The Victorian setting is well done, and so is the werewolf makeup by Rick Baker. So this week, watch an uneven, very bloody remake of The Wolfman. God help us. And on Friday, join the hunt with the 2010 Wolfman kill count. Only on dead meat. I'm afraid the darkest hours of hell lie before you. The Wolfman 2010 can currently be watched on the pictured streaming platforms. Demi always recommends you watch the movie for yourself before its kill count. It's the only way to have your own properly informed opinion. Kill counts are never meant to replace the experience of watching a film. Thanks a lot for watching this kill count. That to the numbers bit was very stressful because I only had the one take at it, you know, ripping the buttons off this thing. I ended up using the second take, so that's why there aren't buttons there uh, at the beginning of that clip. I just don't think the first take was as good. Check it out. All right, cool. So there you have it. Though. That's the Wolfman. So next week will be dwelling down on the alternative kill count reactions as well too no is it yes yeah, alternative kill count then that there's poll week as well too other than that though if you like my reaction or like share subscribe my youtube channel it's your boy t-burst signing off one love